Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, if you don't know who I am, I'm Carrie Ann King. Um, I do fitness stuff here in the office. Um, and this is Will Dean. He is the founder and CEO of Tough Mudder. I have to look at my notes here. $100 million in annual revenue, $13 million for charity. Crane's 40 under 40. Fortune's 40 under 40. Um, 150,000 Twitter followers for Tough Mudder. Um, 2.5 million people have signed up for these races. Um, I had 3,000 people with the logo tattooed on their bodies, but evidently it's a little bit higher than that now. Um, that's an amazing thing to have built Thank you. off of. Let's run around in the mud and yes. run over some mm -hmm. obstacles. Now it's international, there's TV. Um, I loved reading this book. Um, the best way I can describe it is it's a moving business book or a motivational book with um, incredible business advice. That's the only way I can describe it. Uh, it was uh, actually quite touching. And one of the things that amazed me about reading it was how deep this really goes for you. This mm -hmm. concept might have come to you at some point later in life, but it really begins with the beginning of your story, mm -hmm. kind of growing up mm -hmm. in something that I got to experience firsthand, which is a, um, a depressed post-industrial mm -hmm. town in northern England. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah, that's, I mean, yes, that's where I'm from. And it, um, you know, writing a book is, it, it is such a fascinating journey to go on. And, you know, you, you start with these ideas as to what you're going to write and you reflect a bit on it. And, you know, I think I always knew that you know, for me, Tough Mudder was, you know, as much as it's a business and, of course, a money-making entity, you know, it is this purpose-driven organization. You're all fortunate. You also will work at a purpose-driven organization with a very clear mission here at Google. But I think, you know, as I started to reflect on the mission for the company, and we talk about building a global tribe that lives the values of teamwork, camaraderie, courage, personal accomplishment, and fun, you know, and you start asking yourself the question, which the back of your mind you already know the answer to, but you start trying to put it down on paper of why did you do this? And one of the things that I certainly realized as I looked through my entire life, starting as a child and my experiences then through to undergraduate, five years in counterterrorism, and then the MBA program, was this sense of always being somewhere I didn't quite feel like I fitted in. And what's been very interesting, the reaction to the book so far, is so many other people have said that there was something that really resonated with them. And you know, perhaps not something we're all conscious of. We spend our lives walking around feeling like we don't quite fit in places, and most other people are also feeling the same way. And you know, so to try and answer your, your question, I mean, I grew up in a part of England where you don't generally meet that many people. Certainly, if you're in New York, you generally don't meet many people who are from South Yorkshire, which is, you know, and people say, oh, where's it near? And you say, uh, um, it's Sheffield, and they go, I haven't heard of that. <laughs> um, they say, uh, is it near London? And you know, sort of like, well, no, it's the other end of the country. And it's funny because when I'm in London, Brits will say, oh, your family are from there. And, I, and, I, you know, and they, they're surprised to hear, here's a guy with a company who's got a Harvard MBA. And they say, oh, does your family have land up there? Um, because in their mind, that's the only kind of person that would be a successful person in London who started there. You know, and it was a, you know, I mean, I was fortunate. My parents were professional people. But they were, my dad is the one lawyer in this town, works, which is a former pit mining town and which has since been quite decimated with the loss of the pit the, the mine and uh, and so I think that was a very you know, personal part for me this idea of very very tight community kind of ripped apart and you know, what it means to be part of something a community where people look out for one another you know, and what that means when you lose that was definitely something that I, definitely in the back of my mind you know, my parents still live there was you know, part of what drove me to create an event that is very much about community and people coming together and doing something together yeah, I felt that um, very much in the book that this kind of search for solidarity that you saw in yourself that you also saw in the world and decided to create your own solution for it. Um, we c we'll go back a little bit to the Foreign Service, but I just wanted to, the moment where you realized that that solidarity was really necessary, I think you were in a triathlon and that was... I was. I was in an... I was, I was getting my MBA um, and I was, so I was in this business school hyper competitive environment to start with where everyone's on these kind of force curves as to how you're all doing and 
most people there are these very type A personalities. So you put all those people together, it creates a kind of crazy outcome. And I remember doing a triathlon whilst I was there with some HBS colleagues. Um, and this was an event of which there was absolutely no danger I was going to win, absolutely none whatsoever. And I finished the <laughs> swim section, about to start um, the bike section, and uh, you're in the transition zone. And the zipper on my wetsuit had jammed, and I just couldn't get it undone myself. And I turned to the guy next to me, as you are to me right now, and I said, can you just pull on this? You know, and transition times really matter in triathlons. And the guy said, no. I mean, I was probably asking for three, five seconds of his time. And that happened to me twice before somebody helped me. And I just, I found that so weird, because I'm sure they weren't bad people, but there was something about the environment in which they found themselves that just, frankly, didn't bring out the best in humanity. And, you know, I thought a bit about this. And, you know, for any of you that have done a marathon or you know, a half marathon, I don't know if anyone in the room has done one of those. Anyone done a, a couple? So when you do a marathon, I've done a marathon, the first question you get when you've done the marathon is, oh, what time do you do it in? Um, <laughs> first question. And so you answer that question, you say whatever time you did it in, and in my case, you know, I was aiming for sub four hours, and I achieved that, and so I was happy enough. And inevitably, someone then says, oh, my brother-in-law did it quicker. And you're like, <laughs> you're like, oh, that's good. And you feel like saying, yeah, I know I didn't win. Um, I, I know those Kenyans were a long way ahead of me. Um, and, you know, and that, that got me thinking, right? For most people, a race isn't really a race in the classic sense of the word. It's not about where do you place overall. It's much more about personal achievement. And you, know, you have a goal in mind, um, but it's not really about other people. And I thought, is it possible to create an event that you yourself still achieve something, but you're part of something bigger than yourself, and you can have fun, and you can do it as part of a team, and you can also not take yourself too seriously. And it seemed, certainly in the triathlon, people were taking themselves far too seriously in what, in what was an amateur event of where you know, the people next to me were, by definition, also midway down the field as well. Um, and so that was certainly the inspiration behind it. Yeah, and I think I feel like that sounds to me very much in line with how you approach all of the problems that you're solving. How do we use this tension between personal achievement mm -hmm. and group achievement to create the best outcome yeah. rather than just, I got to the top of the pile. Mm -hmm. I hope you guys had fun yeah. too. No, and it, look, it's, it's something I really believe in. I think, you know, a lot of our early lives, education systems tend to put very high emphasis on individual achievement. Very high. What mark did I get? How did I do? Are you smart? Yes or no? And the truth is, in life, you know, very few of us can go and be successful based upon our individual achievements. Maybe writing is actually one of the few examples where it is kind of about one person. But even then, it's not really just you, right? You still have a team around you, editors, publishers, book agents, etc. But you know, in a business environment, it's very different. I mean, I can say I founded Tough Mudder, but at best, I'm 5% of the equation. At best, frankly, far less. You know, it's about all the other people in the company. But far more than that, it's about the community and the tribe that's kind of built up around that, of which now I'm, frankly, a very small cog in that bigger system. And I think far too many people talk about their achievement or think that achievements are about things you do on your own. And some things in life that's true of, but the vast majority of things, including the vast majority of obstacles at Tough Mudder to kind of bring it back to the event, you, they do require you to work with other people to get through. And you can be proud of yourself at the end of the course that you did it and you got yourself through. No one else carried you, or in most cases, no one else carried you. But they probably helped you up Everest and some of the other obstacles. And I think there's something in there about life, um, a, a lesson in life, uh, and the willing, being willing to ask for help, which I think a lot of people struggle with. So um, speaking of being willing to ask for help, I'd love to talk about those early days mm -hmm. of Tough Mudder. Yeah. That was at, um, it's this big international organization now, but as you can imagine, it did not start no. that way. Tell us about that first event. Yes, it was, um, I mean, it was an amazing experience. Uh, you know, we, uh, my co-founder and I, we both had $10,000, had a total startup budget of $20,000. We spent about $10,000 driving around fields outside of New York trying to figure out what the hell we were looking for in terms of a venue, mostly by getting laughed out of town. We eventually found a ski hill uh, just outside of Allentown, Pennsylvania. 
And having not grown up in this country, I genuinely thought Allentown was a fictitious place only in a Billy Joel song. <laughs> um, and, um, uh, but, so we found this ski hill. We gave them a $1,000 deposit. I honestly think they thought they'd never see us again. We built this very simple website, really just a landing page linked to a registration platform on the back end. Um, and we were, I don't know if I'm allowed to use this word whilst I'm over at Google, but we were one of the first advertisers on Facebook back in uh, 2010. Um, and um, uh, you know, I remember two weeks in, we hadn't sold any tickets, not one. I, th I think my sister had bought one to test the website was working for us. Um, and we had a price rise. And the, the first event, tickets went from $50 to $60. And at about 8 o'clock that evening, the press rose was at midnight, things seemed to be slowing down. And we'd sold 200 tickets. And we were hoping to sell 500 for the first event. And Guy, my co-founder, and I, for the first time in about three months, we went for a beer on a Sunday evening. And we were exhausted. And we were working very hard. We were subletting two desks in this really warehouse building, and whilst Dumbo was still kind of a warehouse area before Equinox and all the condos arrived. Um, and um, and I, back then I had a Blackberry Pearl. Do you remember those phones? <laughs> yeah, people remember that? It wasn't that long ago. Um, and um, I used to get an email every single time we sold a ticket. And I remember getting up. We'd only been in this bar for about an hour or so um, and going to the restroom. And I had over a 1,000 emails. Um, and you know, I was looking at this, and every couple of seconds, I'd ref it was refreshing. And I was thinking, wow, another 20 people bought tickets. Wow, another 20 people bought tickets. And we got to midnight, and we'd sold 2,000 tickets. And I remember my heart was beating. So, you know, not the microphone. But, the, but my heart, I could, it was so hard. And you know, I was excited. At the time, I had Citigroup badgering me about paying back my student loans and getting quite aggressive about that. Um, and. Uh, and then I remember Guy and I looking at each other saying, wow, we now actually have to put an event for 5,000 people. Um, you know, and I always tell people the first event was an A plus uh, in terms of um, uh, ticket sales and kind of proving the concept in terms of market demand. And Steph, who's here, was, you were both at the first event. I think I would say it was a D minus in terms of logistics. I don't, yeah, all right. There we are. Um, yeah, no, no, I understand. I understand. No, it was objectively a D minus. It was a, by any stretch of the imagination. So, um, uh, but we just about got through it. But it was, I mean, it was everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. I, we, we totally failed to uh, plan the car parking correctly. The road got backed up. We ran out of water at the water station within 20 minutes. Um, most of the obstacles were closed within the first hour. The course, which we thought was seven miles long, turned out to only be four and a half miles long. And I remember, you know, this thing started and then, you know, coming back down into the base area of the event. And like 35 minutes later, the first person crossed the finish line. And I thought, oh, God, we've made a horrible mistake here. <laughs> so we, we were, you know, we just about survived that first event. But it was, it was very, very stressful. And we had really no idea what we were getting in for. And certainly now when I look at the events and, you know, this kind of army of trucks and warehouses and event professionals that kind of seamlessly move around the world. You know, last weekend we had four events on, so you know, a start wave was going off with various time zones across Europe and Asia, you know, every 15 minutes for 48 hours. And uh, yeah, quite a far cry from Allentown, Pennsylvania, uh, only seven years ago. Yeah, which, you know, brings up the question, given that it was a D minus, mm -hmm. What made you say, okay, let's do that again? Yeah. That seems like a good, aside from all the yeah. ticket sales, because it had to sure. be more than that based yeah. on what I read. No, it, um, you know, I think one of the things to be successful, certainly in entrepreneurship, but I suspect in anything you do, is to have this kind of balanced optimism. And I think sometimes, I mean, entrepreneurs that have this kind of like wild optimism, and then they never become a bit disappointed when things don't all go exactly as they planned. And, become quite despondent. But I think you have to have this, for want of a better term, kind of balanced or cautious optimism that, yes, things won't always go perfectly. And yes, there'll be problems. And you have to accept that many of those you can't anticipate. But it still have this kind of you know, belief that in the long term, it will all work out. Um, you know, and I think I, I do have that, for better or for worse. And I think, for me, that came from believing. Well, I had this data point that showed there was market demand. But over and above that, that you know, this was something, I had this kind of gut feeling, you know, hypothesis, that this is something I would do, my friends would do, and there were other people out there that felt the same way. And none of the barriers I was coming to, although some of them were scary, 
none of them felt insurmountable. And, and I'm not going to tie every single point back to the obstacle course, but you know, I knew there were obstacles out there. I didn't quite know what they were going to be. And yes, they scared me, but they didn't petrify me. And I think that kind of cautious optimism is probably quite a key trait when you're starting a company. Yeah, one of the other things that struck me about those early days reading the book is um, a sense of hunger, mm -hmm. sometimes literal, mm -hmm. yes. but certainly a hunger for achievement yeah. as part of the driving force. No, I mean, that's, that was certainly there. You know, I am, um, you know, my career, uh, I had spent five years in counterterrorism, which was really an amazing five years. And I'd started that after 9-11. Um, and had this amazing set of experiences when, certainly in the UK, you know, the, the infrastructure in place to at least deal with Islamic terrorism was very, very limited back in 2001, 2002. And so it was a very entrepreneurial environment. Funny thing to say, but it really was an entrepreneurial environment. You know, lots of new problems. You had all these people that had spent their entire careers thinking about the Cold War and how to deal with the Soviet threat. And all of a sudden, a completely new set of problems. Old ways of working don't work. And so you had all these kind of you know, bright young things coming in, challenging conventional wisdom, getting to do new things. And I remember going to Gordon Brown when he was the chancellor, our finance minister before he became prime minister. And we were asking for 10 million pounds to go and do this thing in Pakistan. And I remember him saying, here's 12. Um, I mean, that was the environment which you were in at the time. I mean, nowadays, very, very different in terms of budgets. But um, it was an amazing experience, but I'd, I'd done that. I had a great time. I think concluded in the long term it wasn't for me. A tough place to work on a sustained basis, but um, also as it was becoming larger, becoming a bit more bureaucratic. And I got into my head, I'd go to the Harvard, I'd go and get an MBA, I'd learn about business, whatever I thought that meant. I'm not quite sure if I could have really defined it then. I certainly can't now. Um, and I had this sort of two years that Harvard's not a bad place, but it just wasn't the right place. This Harvard Business School is not a bad place. It just really wasn't the right place for me. And so I'd left this career. I'd gone to this prestigious university, which I kind of got inside and didn't find quite as prestigious or as impressive as I thought I was going to. Um, and then I kind of came out of the other end of that, and there's this kind of, ugh, what now? And you know, I had this you know, very clear desire to build something that in my own small way I thought would make a difference in the world. And we don't pretend at Tough Mudder that we're curing cancer or bringing peace to the Middle East, but we are getting people to spend time with their friends, at least spend a few hours not connected to their iPhones and, uh, or other smartphone devices that run on <laughs> other operating systems. Um, um, and, um, uh, um, but um, but I'm, you know, I'm proud of that. And I think, but yeah, it's only aged, what was I when I started the company, 28. Yep, 28, there was a, a desire to prove myself. I think there was a kind of necessity. It's quite, in the early days, it's quite binary. It either fails or it succeeds. At least that's how it feels. Um, and you run very hard and you make quite a lot of sacrifices to do that. But this is, I, I have to bring this up because this was not Will's first venture. No. I know that you had mm. uh, something in university with yeah. t-shirts. A few things, yeah. And then you sold bags for your school so in high, high school. school. Yeah. Um, doesn't there even something in junior high where you actually yeah. had an entrepreneurial project I going did. on? So, um, amazingly, you know, England, it's, it's getting better, but it is not always the most entrepreneurial of places. And my mother recently asked me if I sold Tough Mudder, did I think I could get myself a job in management consulting still? Um, <laughs> I suspect so. Um, but you know, it, it isn't always that. And I think people probably think a bit differently about risk and achievement and those sort of things. But one of the amazing things in the UK is if you're doing reasonably well at school, age 16, you get to drop a subject, and the British government creates a limited liability company for you, and they give you a mentor, and there's about six of you, and it's called Young Enterprise, and you're allowed to go and trade as a limited liability company, even though you're a bunch of high school kids, so, which was great. And in the mid-1990s, we had a static website, and we kind of had all these crazy ideas of things we were going to do. I mean, like 16, 17-year-old kids. and. Um, I managed to convince a company out of Minnesota that made color-changing products. You remember the Global Hypercolor T-shirts? Some of you old enough to remember like the early 1990s. Uh, anyway, so one of the products they had was color-changing nail polish, or nail, what do you call it here? Varnish nail polish. Nail polish, Nail yeah. polish. I spent so much time between Britain and the States, I forget which words we use. Nail polish in the States. And uh, I mean, obviously, I don't use either nail polish or nail varnish, but <laughs> you get my point. Um, and um, 
and they were dealing with these literary, you know, schoolboys. And we had this static website. We were calling them from a payphone, and they gave us the distribution rights, this color-changing nail polish. And it was really quite successful. And we sold it through all these trade fairs. And I really, I think that's probably where I got the bug. And then I did other things in that kind of vein through high school and then undergraduate. So I, I really enjoyed that stuff. And I thought I might, when I finished undergrad, go and start my own business. But then you know, I took the other path that entrepreneurs take and became a counterterrorism officer, as you do. You know. <laughs> So but one of the things that strikes me about all of these endeavors, maybe mm -hmm. except for the nail polish, mm -hmm. but all of the other endeavors really ended up being about a sense of community. Even, even the bags for your high school, yeah. they were you know, kids getting yeah. a bag that said where they went to school. I yeah. thought you know, it was really interesting to me to see that that was that's a, a running the desire yeah. to build a business as a running theme, but so is the desire to create a tribe. And that's how you talk about yeah. Tough Mudders. I, I just, we have about, how many members of the tribe are in the room today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It counts. It counts. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so you know, this is, um, Google is certainly a tribe mm -hmm. of a certain type, and sure. we have a sub-tribe of Google Tough Mudders as well. But that, you know, I think that's such a key piece of what Tough Mudder means. Well, I think, you know, it, um, you know, sometimes when I say this, I worry that people think it sounds cynical because suddenly I don't think the company is this way. But I think there is an unmet, unmet human need for belonging. Um, and I think, you know, Tough Mudder allows people to feel several things, right? They feel part of something bigger than themselves. It doesn't take itself too seriously. There is an achievement at the end of it that you can tell all your friends on a Monday morning that you did post about it on social media, et cetera. And I think, you know, when I was at business school, and I'm not by any stretch of the imagination, and I'm not just saying this because I'm at Google today, anti-people that go and start tech businesses, but I think when I was at business school, it was kind of taught that the only kind of way you could start a company was to find the angel investor. Well, it was, if you were at Harvard, find three geeks from MIT, if I pair them up with an angel investor, uh, <laughs> then there's kind of five steps of VC, and then you IPO, and there's just a playbook, and that's, that's what a Harvard entrepreneur does. And, um, and I'm not anti that, I'm not saying that's wrong, but I think I reject the notion that that's the only way of doing it. And I think when I look at, and part of why I wrote the book, and certainly when I look at Tough Mudder, we didn't take outside capital, and we're not a tech-enabled business. Well, okay, we have a website, right? But, you know, my father was a provincial lawyer. He has a website. I'm not, not sure that makes me a tech <laughs> business. Um, and, um, and I think um, you know, this idea of creating something, you know, I think a lot of smart marketers, product designers, you know, are good at understanding the underlying psychology of what people want. And they don't just think about what are the attributes of, of the product. I mean, maybe if you're selling soap powder, that you only care about whether it gets your shirt clean. But you know, for Tough Mudder, it's an experience, right? And so. You know, it's much more than just a rational purchase. It taps into something quite emotional. And, and I've always, I think, to some extent, had an intuitive understanding of that, but I've always you know, found it more interesting to operate in that space as well. And do you feel like the physical aspect of it is part of, like, could you create community in that way if it were a, a video game, a concept sure. that you actually rejected yeah. at some point? Um, you know, and so I, I think, you know, the underlying value of, Tough, mindset of Tough Mudder is around this idea that you know, we should all try and do things that challenge ourselves. And, and for those of you that have come to a Tough Mudder, 15%, 20% of people are in very, very good shape. 60% of people look like most of the people that you see you know, walking around, or you see in the gym or walking around the streets in a place like New York. And then 15, 20% of people, candidly, I'm kind of surprised they signed up for a 12 mile event. Um, but you know, good for them that they did. And I, you know, we've always tried to be anything but elitist in our approach to uh, what it means to be, you know, challenge yourself. And you know, we don't have rules if you don't complete one of the, obst one of the obstacles. And you know, that was something that we decided very early on because we were having you know, people with disabilities write to us and say, I, I want to do a Tough Mudder, but I can't do this obstacle. And I thought, I mean, if life isn't hard enough for you to start with, the fact you have to write to me and ask for dispensation to go around an obstacle, that's just wrong. That isn't how it should be. And so, um, or the idea that you might be punished or penalized for that just seemed, yeah, very wrong uh, to me. And so, you know, 
I think, yes, the community is born out of the fact that everybody has been through this experience together, right? If you see another Tough Mudder running in the park in a Tough Mudder shirt, probably you will high-five them. And I certainly, if you see someone in the world's toughest mudder gear, <laughs> this guy has done, because you hadn't noticed, um, uh, has done a, a world's toughest, which is the 24-hour non-stop Tough Mudder. And that, is, you know, that event literally does go on for 24 hours. People do as many loops of the course as they can. And that is definitely a community, I think you'd agree, right? And you know, that exists way beyond you know, the event weekend itself. And people get together, they have friends through it. And I, I do think it's born out of the fact that the people have been through something that challenged them physically, to some more than others, but also scared them a little in places. You know, some of the obstacles are a bit intimidating, like electroshock therapy, the wires you run through or Arctic Enema, which is the dumpster full of ice. Um, and I, I think, yes, that, that kind of underpins it. Um, but one of the things, I, I know I'm giving you quite a long answer here, but it's a really important part of the book, an important part of the company. One of the things I'm most proud of is I remember being on the start line of the first ever event in the UK back in 2012. And you know, for better or for worse in England, you can tell very, very quickly where someone's from, both geographically, and we have our, our class system. I'm not defending it, it just is what it is. You can tell where someone's from geographically. You can tell very quickly I don't know, how much education they have. You can probably infer quite a lot about their uh, uh, socioeconomic background, etc. really within two or three seconds. And, I remember being on the start line and just hearing all these very different accents and, and thinking, wow, I would have never have guessed that you would have such a diverse group of people who, when they all get in the mud, are all just you know, one group. And you know, whether they arrived in a 15-year-old beat-up truck or a brand new 7 Series BMW is irrelevant, right? You're just all people helping each other out in the mud. And I think there's something about it that's a leveler. I think it's about something that, frankly, strips away some of the bullshit that we, as adults, all surround ourselves with. Uh, and I think you know, it, it's a lot of what explains why we've been successful. And I feel like you really try to instantiate a very similar ethos inside the company yeah. as well, is that this is not something that lives out there mm -hmm. for the users, but not yeah. inside the company. Yeah, oh, oh, completely. I think the best companies I think successful brands have to ultimately practice what they preach and they have to believe in their values and their, their mission. And sometimes internally, and I'll say that's true even at Philip Morris, which is probably an organization that many of us don't have very much time for, they have a value of adult choice. That is something they believe in. And you don't go and work at Philip Morris unless you believe that, right? I mean, that or you have to have some, some, some views of the world which I perhaps wouldn't agree with. But I think most people there do go for that reason. And, in that way, maybe in that way alone, Tough Mudder is similar to Philip Morris, that people come to Tough Mudder because you know, they could get a better paycheck somewhere else in New York City, for sure, because they believe in what we're doing, they believe in the mission, and we try to create a culture that's consistent with that. And you know, one of the things I always say about company culture you know, is it has nothing to do with cold beer in the fridge or foosball tables or any of that stuff, which sometimes I think gets written about when we talk about sort of entrepreneurial environments. It's very, very simple. Culture is about how do people behave when their boss isn't looking. It's behavioral norms, that's all it is. So what do people do when their boss isn't looking? When I, when I walk by, people quickly shut down Facebook. And I'm like, what, do you really think, you, I don't believe you check Facebook, you know? Why are you hiding it from me? It's just silly. And, you know, mostly most of the people at Tough Mudder aren't like that. And if they are, they probably don't stay with us all that long. And it, I think it's a really important point. You have to. I get, I get some flack from the media from this that I say, oh, people who work at Tough Mudder should do the events. And I don't mean every single weekend, but they should do one probably at least once a season so they can see the people out there, they can interact with the community, they can understand what it's all about. And some people say, well, isn't that very elitist? And I say, I'm not saying they have to win an event, I'm just saying they should take part in it. Um, and I really believe that stuff. And I do believe the great, great companies have internal cultures that are consistent with their brand values. And that's something that I feel like you did struggle a little mm -hmm. bit with in terms of scaling and yeah. keeping that mm -hmm. oh, definitely. culture yeah. solid yeah. and what it, you yeah. wanted it to be. Yeah, I am. Um, you know, we, uh, we have something called the Legionnaire Program, which is the program for the repeat mudders. And I wanted to call that the repeat offenders. Um, <laughs> and, um, uh, and we just hired somebody from a very large um, uh, very, very large, uh, publicly traded company where she'd be, she was very senior in marketing there and she'd come in to be our 
CMO. And she really grandstanded me on this point. She said, well, people are going to hear repeat offenders. They're going to think violent offenders. People are going to go to domestic violence. And you're going to be saying that tough mudders are all these things. And I said, I, I just don't think the vast majority of people will go there. I just don't. She said, well, they could. I said, well, look, I mean, almost anything is theoretically possible, but that can't be the standard that we hold ourselves to. And I said, well, someone might be offended. I mean, look, the name of the company is Tough Mudder, you know? Like, I mean, we're clearly, the, the whole name is a play on words. And, you know, I remember this being a situation where I had lots of people kind of trying to save me from myself, you know, this kind of conventional wisdom getting the better of things. And that's not to say that I'm always right. In fact, often I'm wrong on things. Um, but we weren't having a sensible, logical discussion. There was, disag there was disagree disagreement, but people weren't being disagreeable in the way they were approaching it. And yeah, I mean, that's, that's a challenge. And I think maintaining culture, you don't build a culture and then it's done. It's not like a warehouse. You're like, OK, boom, finished. That works. You know, it's something that you have to stay hyper vigilant of. And you know, I, I also get flat because you know, I'm, you know, as people here from Tough Mudder will know, you know, I get very, very fussy about people, things like washing up dishes or turning lights off in meeting rooms because it's those small things that are indicative of an environment where everyone's pulling together as a team. And if the event is all about people pulling together as a team and you're not doing that internally, it doesn't matter. Clearly, dishes are not a strategic matter in of themselves, but I do think they're indicative of something. Yeah, I, I, and that was one of the things that um, was so interesting to read about how you your faith and your vision allowed you to correct course and really um, lead to an even greater expansion of the brand. How do you keep the brand authentic yeah. when it's on TV yeah. and on five continents and gyms and shoes and... You know, and it's, it's funny, right, because, you know, I mean, you know, this is, I'm sure, an environment as well. People talk about the importance of failure and making mistakes and learning from mistakes and you know it can all be a bit cliche if you're not careful but lots of people have come into Tough Mudder today and they've been very successful you know they worked hard at high school they got into a good university they then worked hard through that college program they got into a great place and they've really only ever experienced modicums of success right they haven't really ever dealt with spectacular failure and you can tell this because they give you interview answers of like, you know, when their boss didn't like a presentation they gave you or some, something. You know, like these are not the kind of things that change someone's world view. These are kind of like my, minor slaps on the wrist of the worst of it. And I think it is hard to keep pushing people to do new things and taking risks. And I think one of the values of Tough Mudder is also being somewhat irreverent um, and challenging conventional wisdom and asking why. I think that's very central to the idea. Even the obstacle names, the name of the company, I think, speak to that. Um, and it, it's hard, um, you know, and my role in the innovation process, I don't think it's to be the kind of creative force per se, um, and whether I'm creative or not is just irrelevant. It's about creating an environment where it's permissive to go and do things that in other environments, people might not go and do that. So, you know, electroshock therapy is a great example. And I'll say, just, just go and do it. Like, we'll, 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 we'll. Like, who else do you want to check with? I'm not, not saying this to brag, but I control the Tough Mudder board. So I'll say, like, I've, the CEO's approved it, the board's approved it. Who else do you want to approve this? The Pope? I mean, like, <laughs> right? I mean like, just please go and make electroshock therapy work. And, you know, and I think trying to empower people to do that, and people are like, what if? What if it fails? Well, then we won't do it again. Uh, that's, that's what will happen. And things often don't work out. And I think. Trying to get people to reflect on failure in a way that doesn't become this kind of painful exercise can be, can be quite hard. And I think it's something you either get or you don't get. You know, we use the five whys tool a lot. It's probably something you use here a lot um, you know, to try and understand what went wrong, um, you know, really kind of dig into the root causes. Some people just hate that. They just you know, they turn the, themselves in knots to try and avoid doing it. Um, you know, and, and that person probably isn't going to enjoy Tough Mudder in the long term. And I try and be very honest with people. And I, this is the Tough Mudder employment satisfaction uh, survey results. Nine out of 10 people are really happy. One in 10 people are really unhappy. I'm not going to try and fix those one in 10 people because they're not in the six to seven out of 10 range. They're probably not going to be back at eight or nine very soon. In fact, they clearly don't like it. We're not the right place for them. Mostly we're in New York City and they have, other alter they have alternative career options that they can go after. Let them go do that because we are not all things to all people. And being very comfortable with that, and being very comfortable with that, both in terms of a hiring perspective, but also as a brand perspective. 
Now, some people say, oh, I hate Tough Mudder. It's all about teamwork and camaraderie. Sometimes people even tell me it's not competitive, it's un-American. Ah, well, it's true, I am not American. That's what's very astute. Um, but it's funny, you know, some people really, you know, they kind of have this visceral dislike of an event that isn't about, you know, competition and there's something wrong with it, that I'm part of this movement of people that gives all the kids medals at high school and, you know, I'm what's wrong with American society. Um, and some people say that. I'm like, okay, fine, don't come and do my event. That's okay. Yeah, I mean, I th it's... Uh not that you need me to jump to your defense, but it's some, what's very clear to me as and some, someone who's never run a Tough Mudder is that um, this actually isn't about not being competitive. There's something keenly competitive mm -hmm. about it, but it strikes a beautiful balance between competitive and cooperative mm -hmm. that would be great if we could strike it more in yeah. more places. I mean, I think that's right. Um, you know, and one of the things I really do miss from my time in counterterrorism was there was a very deep sense of camaraderie and, I don't know, letting, never letting other people fail. But it was also an environment that had quite a lot of type A people in. It absolutely did. Um, and I think there was this sense of, like, who's doing the best. But there was this sense as well of, like, you don't let people fall behind because it really matters. You know, if things go horribly wrong there, people die. Um, and so, you know, there's this kind of unwritten rule that you helped each other out. And, and I, I miss that because my experience, not to bash Harvard, was there was none of that at business school. You know, in fact, you were very happy if someone was bottom of the pile you know, because they were kind of propping up that force curve. Um, very, very different from what I was used to. So um, I want to leave time for questions, but I have to ask you um, one last one because reading the book, mm -hmm. One of the questions that I had about you yep. was, okay, this is who this guy is. Mm -hmm. This thing is so deeply ingrained. Yeah. If this hadn't worked, what would you, yeah, what do you think he would have done? That's like, I guess yeah. it just seems like such a, yeah. such a perfect project. It, um, well, okay, I mean, look, it's, you know, counterfactuals and hindsight are wonderful things. It, um, you know, I, when I was at, when I was starting Top Model, I had no idea whether it would be successful or not. Um, you know, and I, I'm not sure that ever completely goes away. You know, even when you kind of get to a certain level of success, there's still this question of, uh, well, will people still be doing it in five or ten years' time? I don't know if that ever quite leaves you. Um, but when I started, and I will answer your question, but I, the realization I came to, since the age of 28, was, look, I'm not married, I don't have a mortgage, I don't have any dependents. If I give this a year or two of my life and it doesn't work out, it's unlikely when I'm 40 years old, I'm not going to have the things that matter. And, and I think, um, you know, I think there's something quite wrong in some of what increasingly you do see in elements of the culture in Silicon Valley, which is starting to look in some ways quite a lot like Wall Street. You know, it's all about who's raised the most money. You know, it creates, it attracts a lot of very type A people. And I'm not, you know, they may talk, some of the people there may talk a good game about building the future. But, you know, I still have people say to me, oh, how much money has Tough Mudder raised? And I say, oh, we haven't taken any money. And people still say to me, it's going to be okay. And, I, and I'm like, yeah, I, I think it will be. Thank you. Um, but it still happens. And, and so I, I promise you I'm going to answer the question. But no, I think okay. it starts from, uh, for me, it really started from saying, look, it's going to be okay financially. The things I need in life to be happy, I'm fortunate. Not everyone does in life, but I'm fortunate. I'm reasonably well educated. I'm not unintelligent. I'm reasonably hard working. I'm going to check those boxes one way or another. Um, you know, so what would I have done? I think, you know, one of the obvious things to go and do when you've got an MBA is to go and do something kind of consultancy related. It pays the bills. You know, I spent my summer at Bain and I was always shocked by how many people there said, I really thought I was coming to Bain for two years and then I was going to start my own thing. Um, and I've been here seven years now. I'm not quite sure what happened there. Um, so I suspect I'd have kind of bounced into some kind of relatively well-paid, comfortable, slightly dull job. And then within a year or two, I'd have got bored and started something else, which probably would have been about community and doing things together because those are the things I find interesting. Yeah, having read the book, I think that's what yeah. you would have done. We have. <laughs> I to I, it's, um, and you, you actually um, got to one of the key points um, for me in the book, which is the risk is worth taking. And maybe even when you're not 28 and don't have a mortgage, yeah. maybe even when you have a mortgage and a family, that there's um, 
if the energy is there. If you believe in what you're doing, yeah. for sure. I mean, I think standard companies, your own company is one of the most rewarding things you can do. Um, it isn't always fun, and it, frankly, at times, is very lonely, and I try and touch on that in the book. You know, it's not for everyone. You know, I sometimes see these books that are called things like Anyone Can Do It. Well, that's a bit like saying anyone can have a six pack. I mean, it's technically true, but most of us don't really want to go through the pain to achieve it. Um, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of what we've achieved. I'm very pleased I, I did it. It certainly wasn't easy at times. Um, but I'm not one of these people that tells everyone, oh, you should all go and start your own companies too. I think it's a very personal choice. And I think you have to be very clear why you're doing it um, and what you hope to achieve. And you have to, you have to own your own definition of success. Uh, the second you allow anybody else to try and impose that upon you, you're going to have real problems. Um, and I think that's very important when you're starting your own, whatever the organization does, but certainly if you're starting a company. So um, I would love to open the floor up for questions. We have a microphone. Alan's there with the mic. Does anybody? Hi. Well, um, Carrie may have told you, but every year we organize a little race on the Hudson River, it's a little 5K, mm -hmm. and there's something that keeps me up all night that I wonder how you deal with, because sure. we don't have obstacles, but you can get run over by a police tow truck. Sure. Um, <laughs> how do you deal with that fear of someone yeah. might get hurt at my event? Yeah, so, you know, let me give you the kind of, the stock answer I get, you know, when I get asked this, which is true. The most dangerous part of doing a Tough Mudder is the drive to a Tough Mudder. You are far more likely to injure yourself, getting yourself to the start line, than what happens on course. Um, you know, I am proud of the safety systems we have in place. All of the obstacles do have medics and divers in place. But when I started the business, I thought if we're moderately successful, we will have injuries um, or worse. Um, and that has happened. You know, it's well documented. And statistically, it's just it's a given. You know, people, we've now had over three million people do the event. You know, I, things happen. To, you know, if you t we took three million days of people's lives. Statistically, a certain number have heart attacks and other problems. It just happens. Um, you know, to give a very candid answer, it's still very, very difficult on the personal level. You can be very proud of what you've built, and you can look at you know, people who come to you and they say, I lost 50 pounds, or you know, I overcame alcoholism, or I beat depression training for a Tough Mudder. Um, you know, and the book talks about some of that stuff. But you know, if somebody does your event, you know, and it, they don't come back, we've had, we've had a death at our events. Um, it's very difficult, and you know, I'm the founder and CEO of the company. As the CEO, well, I mean, the insurers understand it. You know, statistically, it, it happens. Um, you know, our rates are very, very low because our events are very safe. It's safer than a marathon or a triathlon. But on a personal, it's very, very difficult when something happens. And I think, you know, but I can sleep at night, and I think I can because I genuinely believe we have the right systems and processes in place, and I believe. People take their responsibility, and it is a responsibility, very, very seriously. And I think when you look at the Tough Mudder environment, we're trying to create an environment that's scary without being dangerous. Um, you know, I'm sure many of you have been on a roller coaster. But the whole idea of a roller coaster is it's scary. I don't think anyone really thinks of it as being dangerous, at least if you do want to hear in you know, the United States or in Western Europe or something. Um, so, uh, but no, look, it's a, it's a serious point, and I think, you know, I don't think you should ever stop worrying about that. You know, I mean, we have events every weekend, and I get an email every end of day, every Saturday, and every Sunday, just to say, "Yep, everyone got back." And you know, some there are of course sprained ankles and cuts and bruises. That's just a given with an event. Um, but it is difficult. But I, I believe we have the right systems and processes. We have professionals in place. We work with third parties that review what we're doing. Um, but uh, yeah, it's something you have to take very seriously. Before the first event, I mean, trying to get insurance was a challenge. It really was. You know, it took a lot of hard work and effort. Um, but now it's pretty straightforward. You know, I still hear people say, oh, it must be a, a liability nightmare. But it's really not. I mean, you point to three, uh, three million data points now to support your claim. Yeah, Ken and I spend a lot of time worrying together. Yeah. <laughs> I'm wondering, what's your favorite obstacle and why? Yeah. It, um, so my, it's a funny thing to say. My favorite obstacle is one that we genuinely invented by accident. Um, so the head of my obstacle innovation lab refers to it as Tough Mudder's equivalent of penicillin. Um, and we have an obstacle called Block Nest Monster. Um, and these guys are all nodding at the front row. Oh, yeah, <laughs> Block Nest Monster. And what Block Nest Monster is, for those of you that don't know it, um, it's a series of rotating, um, kind of look like t giant Toblerones. And they spin around, floating on the surface of the water. 
um, and you have to grab hold of it and then other people spin it around and they flip you back over and you kind of land head first back in the water. It's really fun, it's actually somewhat challenging and it's almost impossible to do on your own, almost impossible. And I, so I really in, enjoyed that, I was doing it at the weekend, we were being filmed for some TV out there and it was just a, a, a great moment, everyone was working together and the presenter I was with kind of fell off the back of it and she was just laughing and I wasn't sure she was going to be laughing so that was great. Um, <laughs> But, um, but we genuinely invented it by accident, as I said. So Block Ness Monster, the idea was not that you kind of climbed over it and went down the other side, but originally the idea was it was going to be a replacement for our balance beam obstacle, Twinkle Toes, and you're going to run across it. And so we built this thing, and it didn't work. I mean, people just kept falling off it. They either got straight across, or they came off it straight away, and it, people didn't like it at all. And, and then we just observed in this kind of anthropological way the thing people were really enjoying was trying to get back onto the obstacle because it was rotating. And so we just said, well, instead of trying to take people across it, let's take them over it that way. And, um, and so it's become one of our highest scoring obstacles. So it checks a lot of the boxes for us. You know, it, um, it's about teamwork. It is somewhat physically demanding and you've got to really hang on to it. it in its own kind of way, it's a bit scary because you kind of get plunged head first back into the water, but it's also fun. You know, and those are the four values of Tough Mud are all kind of combined into one, so that's probably my favorite obstacle. Um, you're in a very competitive space, yeah. um, and it's often been called like a fad. Yeah, yeah. Um, how do you view your competitors, and what do you think gets you to that next million yeah. Tough Mudder participants? Yeah, so I think, you know, it, um, I get, you know you're right, and we've, since, since the first event, people said, oh great, you did a, one event, I'm not sure I'll come to the second event. Um, I will say in the last year or two, people have been saying that a bit less, you know, I think people have kind of figured out it's here to stay. There is a community that come back and do these events every year. But there's also lots of new people that come along and do them. I think, um, you know, what was true three or four years ago is there were lots of people entering this space and they said, oh, I've got a farm. I know how to build some obstacles. My brother-in-law can build me a website. Um, I'll use my barn you know, for all the logistics. You know, and some of these things, frankly, became glorified Ponzi schemes because they sold some tickets for the first event, and then all the bills came in for the first event. And they were like, oh, I thought I'd made money. I better open three events to pay for the first event. You know, and that kind of went OK for a year or two, but like all these things, it comes to an end. And look, I think you know, Tough Mudder as, as a company has to do three or four things well. You know, we now actually have quite a large performance marketing team that spend a lot of time worrying about 12-month campaigns leading up to every single individual event, first thing. Second. I think there's a chicken and egg part to this. We have the biggest obstacles, so we get the most people. Because we have the most people, we can build the biggest and the best obstacles. And there's something of a flywheel effect that happens there. You know, we have great partners. We have you know, three TV shows, CBS, uh, C CW, Warner Brothers here in the US. And then we have a partnership uh, in the UK with Sky Sports and then with a social media company that have just launched a competitor to, uh, to YouTube. Um, I believe it's called Facebook Watch. Um, and uh, so we have a partnership with them as well. Uh, and, um, you know, and so that helps f increase demand, engagement, brand awareness, brand affinity. You know, and then you have great partners as well. You know, um, you know, Lucas Aid was kind of a British glimpse of Gatorade. We're on the side of 50 million bottles in the UK this year, which in a country of 60 million people is a huge number. So I think the end result is you have to do several things well. And I think if you look at the space, there's really us and one other player. Um, and um, you know, Spartan, uh, very much about race, individual, penalties if you fail. And it's not that I think that's wrong, that's just not us. And you know, minivans and Porsches have something in common, but they're not really marketing to the same people. And um, I think in that regard, and you can guess who I think is the minivan in that equation, but um, um, <laughs> I, the truth is they're quite different products. And in the main, they attract very different people. There's actually very, there's a very low level of customer overlap, um, which, uh, you know, so that, does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. So one more. Mm -hmm. Hi, Will, thanks Hi. for coming. I actually had like pretty much the same question, um, yeah. but I was just, uh, and I think it's all about, um, it's an awesome experience. How do you get people to come back a second time? Yeah. And I guess uh, like uh, maybe a follow-up question to that would be, Events, as most people know, are very, very expensive. Like your costs are very high, and yeah. ticket sales only cover so much. So you yeah. go into sponsorship, and you guys have gotten some really great partners. Yeah. Like, what has been, what to you is like a key 
in determining like what's worth a partnership or sponsorship versus like you never want that image of selling yourself out just to get yeah. the money because you need it from a business perspective. No, 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 you do. Um, so I think uh, you know, so there's a few things in that. So our, our repeat rate's actually pretty high. So our year-on-year -year repeat rate's about 50%, and that compares to that 9% for a marathon or a triathlon. So we're pretty happy with that. Um, and increasingly, our in-year repeat rate's higher as well. Um, so customer lifetime value is now in the thousands of dollars for us. Um, and of course, we know our customer acquisition costs. Uh, you know, they're going up, unfortunately. You guys should bear that in mind. Um, but um, uh, there's, this, you know, there's a serious point that we really think about that. We have the Legionnaire program, which for the repeaters, you get different color headbands, different obstacles. We have a series of different events, 5K half, full, tougher, toughest, world's toughest. So there's a kind of you know, progression there as well. Um, you know, I think if you define us as an events business in 2017, I mean, that's like half of our business. You know, we're a sports, media, entertainment, lifestyle company. And I feel comfortable calling us a lifestyle company because now 20,000 people have had the logo tattooed on them. And um, there aren't many brands that can say that. And, uh, you know, so how does our business work? Well, you put on the events, they have to break even. That's a, that's a given. Um, and we kind of know how many places in the world you can go and do that. And we have a pretty good sense of how many people will show up because we now have seven years worth of data. You then have a media business and a sponsorship business, um, and those kind of coexist, and one fuels the other. Um, and then we have the training business, so we're just launching the gyms now, we're moving into the boot camp space. Um, you know, and that really is the kind of local community hub to the event, you know, mass congregation of the tribe. And you know, I think of those as an ecosystem. And most businesses, you start with one product, and hopefully that goes well, and you get your lucky break, and I definitely got mine but then you hopefully move into other things as well, which I think we've done. And we've tried to create things that, re that reinforce the underlying business, but are also consistent with our values and mission around building a tribe that lives the values of teamwork and camaraderie, fun, personal accomplishment and courage, um, which I think we've tried to do in everything. And you're right, I mean, look, there are sponsors we wouldn't work with, and there are sponsors that we do work with that occasionally want to go and do something, and we say, yeah, that, no, we can't do that, that won't work. For us, but I think you know, the partners that tend to come with us are the ones that understand that in the long term they don't win if they piggyback on our authenticity rather than help build it. <coughs> so, thank you so much for being here, Walt. No, my it pleasure. Was, thank um, you for having I me. highly recommend the book. It's an entertaining read, um, and almost has me ready to do a tough mutter. Almost, almost. almost. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, look, thank you guys. It really was an honor to be here. So.